Hello and welcome to Taskmaster Talks with Kevin Sullivan. I am your host, J.P. John. Pause with me, of course, the star of the show, the former WCW and ECW World Tag Team Champion, one of the greatest minds and bookers ever in the history of the business, the Games Master, the Taskmaster, the Devil himself, Mr. Kevin Sullivan. Kevin, how are you doing today, sir? Good, J.P. How are you, my friend? Doing good, doing good. So what do you think of the current WWE product? I was just curious about that. I know you, you watch a little bit, you keep up with it, but what do you think about the, the current product, the current regime? I think they're doing an incredible job. I think they really are. And I mean, I don't know if it's possible, you know, maybe I got uh, superpowers. There's so many superheroes now, but don't you get a feeling when you're watching the TV that they're, the guys seem to be more on their toes. They're more uplifted. You know what I'm saying? It almost looks like they're digging hard because they're not afraid. And I think they're doing I think Hunter's doing an amazing job. You know, uh, hey, they were on a bad slide for a while, and I'm not uh, disparaging Vince. He had a hell of a run. You know what I mean? He was like the Bill Belichick. But what's Belichick's record this year? You know what I mean? And last year. So, I mean, I, I think they're, and they got their talent is really very, very good. AEW's talent's great too, but it's like this has kind of gelled and Roman has come into his own, you know what I mean? And they sat and place guys around them. KO is back, right? And uh, I think it's very, very good product. What do you think of Sami Zayn and the bloodline, that storyline? It's very interesting, isn't it? Hmm. I like it because Sami, it's like, what's wrong with this picture if you see the bloodline? What's he doing there? Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. There's something that attracts people's eye where you're saying there's something wrong with the picture. This Dusty, when I, the Varsity Club, who I don't think ever got the credit, meaning Steiner, Rotunda, Dr. Death didn't get the credit they deserved. But Dusty put me with them. They get Vasi jackets on. I'm a black robe. It's like, it grabs your eye like, this is so far wrong. What is this about? And that's what I think we're going with. I mean, <sighs> Zane is as white bread as you can be, right? Oh, yeah. Big time. And they're island boys, and there's something that attracts your eye to it, and you go, whoa. I think, yeah, I think it's very entertaining and very, uh, I think this one's thought out, don't you? Yes, very much so. What do you think is the end game here? Is it Sammy versus Roman Reigns in a big match for the title? Or would it be anybody else against... The Usos, because let's face it, I think Romans earned the right to work less, right? And I think they're going to, I mean, this is no, not knocking Sammy at all, but they got to a point now where Romans are almost unbeatable, right? Yep. They'd have to really, really do something remarkable to get Sammy in that position. But bringing Sammy in with another guy, you're going to have a great match as a semifinal on Roman whoever. You know what I mean? I, and, you know, it could be Kevin Owens. It could be a host of guys they got there with Sammy. So I don't know. But it isn't out of uh, the realm that Sammy could work with Roman because they're coming up with some good stuff. So the rumor right now they're saying for Mania is The Rock versus Roman Reigns and then the Usos versus Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens for the tag title. So it'd be interesting to see the buildup building up to Will Zayn get a title shot. So what we just talked about, right, about the tag match. That'd be a good match to support. I mean, I don't think, do you think, uh, I'm still not sure The Rock's going to come back. Are you? I don't know. I hope so. But I just was hearing something with, 
other movies he's got going on and the insurance and getting him to be able to take two months out of his schedule to do it. It's like, it seems like a lot of uh, chess pieces have to be moved around for this guy. And to, this is my opinion. I would love to see the rock and roll. Love. To, okay. It'd be, it would be the biggest box office attraction in the history of the business. But what do you think the insurance policy they'd have to take out on rock? Because remember a few, a few, uh, was it when Rhonda came? Did he get hurt a little? What is ribs? Against uh, John Cena. Okay. Yeah. Somebody had to pay out, brother. Yeah, they were saying that it, it slowed his next film, the, the filming yeah. of it, it slowed that down because he was out with the, some sort of abdominal injury. Yeah. Yeah. And the insurance company had to pay out. Yep. So who's going to write that? Uh, policy it's going to cost a lot of money for and, sure and the other thing right now with him being the biggest box office attraction of movies are any studios just going to allow him to go and do this and saying hey you're going to have to take at least three weeks off before you go and then what would happen if you got hurt? I mean, I, I just don't. As a wrestling fan, of course I want to see it. You want to see it. The world wants to see it. But, you know, we're like kids. We want what we want, right? Mm -hmm. Hey, I, I want that Ferrari. I don't want to pay for it, but I want that Ferrari. There's a lot of money that could be lost. You know what I mean? Well, suppose just hypothetically, you know, Rock's gonna give Rome the best match he'd ever had. What if they both take a bump over the top and Roman lands with his knee on Rock's eye? That's 275 pounds coming down your eyeball. Yep, I don't know. Be interesting because you could do a whole thing with Afa and Sika. Like, is, is he really like? Aren't they? You know, that Rock is also somebody they have loved for years. But then you got Roman, the Tribal Chief. Then you got Solo Sokoa, who kind of he's with them, but he was sent by the elders to kind of watch over Roman. But was that a good thing? I mean, there are so many intriguing things you could do family wise with the Samoans. Right. right. I mean, if uh, you had them all come out, it'd be a, a small marching band. <laughs> you know, so I, I don't, of course, I'd love to see it, but I sometimes forget as wrestling fans, we don't understand this, in other words, the wrestling business. And now you're talking about the wrestling business and the movie business. I just hope it does turn out, though. Did you guys ever run into issues with Hogan and the insurance companies, like when he had a film movies or no? No, no. Because they were B, B films, essentially, or they weren't not, big films? Not that they were B films, that they were action movies like The Rock Mix, you know what I mean? Even though he has his own stunt guy, he's doing something there, do you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. And, and, and his movies are, you know, exciting, right? I mean, they're action movies where Hogan's, you know, uh, The Nanny and uh, the one where three ninjas in the amusement park and you know they're kind of uh more geared to kids yep it was in the, in the, in the, him running through blowing up buildings getting blown up it's true you know what's interesting about hogan that i just was figuring out recently they released all these new toys right the the action figures the the wrestling guys yeah so I've counted how many Hogan has out this year, at least 12. So to say that like, he's waning in popularity is crazy because all these adults must be buying all these, you know, all the old Hogan must be buying all these Hogan toys. I can't believe that. I counted 12 new in, two, in 2022 yet. And, and coming up, he's got 12 new toys out new, or action figures. Insane. Yeah. And you know, it's funny. I happen to watch that uh, Undisputed Truth, the Mike Tyson one man show. Have you seen that? Yes. Yep. He mentions Hogan. Hmm. So, I mean, this guy's over like a rogue right now, Mike Tyson. 
And he's hanging out with Nate, smoking weed yeah, all the time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Was he a big weed guy, Flair? He doesn't I, seem like he would have been. I don't think I've ever, I never heard of Rick ever smoking. Never heard of him. But, I mean, he's going to make money off the weed. I don't think Rick is going to partake. I don't know. Maybe he would. Hey, maybe Tyson talked him into it. You know, he's yeah. he, he could be convincing. Yeah, sure it can be. But uh, just to talk about Flair for a second, he said on his podcast he'll be back in WWE for the 30th anniversary show. So apparently the Triple H mended fences there with Triple with uh, WWE and Flair. Well, I saw something today too that it was taken out of contents, or he he said it wrong that he'll be at there on independent signing. Oh, yeah. he made it out to be. Oh, the yeah. way they somebody worded it, the yeah. way they put it into the into the headline, and, yeah. and I read the article too. They even took a quote, and I guess they cut it cut it in half. Okay, is that what you call clickbait? Yes, yes, and even they misquoted him because they cut the quote off. Well, I read the quote, and if you read his quote, it was like that. You know what I mean? Yeah, he, he's just saying, "Hey, I'll be there too." You know, and then later on, he had to come back and say, well, that is what, exactly what I meant. Ah, I missed that part. Okay, so he'll be in town, though, so they could bring him back. Okay. Yeah, he's going to be in San Antonio signing. Uh, signing. Interesting. Yeah, I know the big Fitterman. I know he's big down there in uh, Texas. I don't know if that's his home base or not, but that's where WB has a lot of their, their guys signing through Fitterman Sports, too. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. So, Flair... I don't know. I mean, obviously not wrestling wise, but I still feel like he could be a a good part of the show. I mean, they put him back into their entrance video when you know the package to start the show. So you know, he still could be a a, a little bit of a contributor, considering his history in the business and with WWE. Right, I think so too. So today, what we want to talk about the topic at hand, if you will, a WCW Mayhem 2000, which was held back on November 26 from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, at the U.S. Cellular Arena. 3,800 people in attendance. Not that great for a WCW pay per view. I mean, we've seen way, way more than that. The tagline, the genetic freak of sports entertainment unleashed with a big picture of Scotty Steiner. Pay per view buys only 55,000. What is going on here? I know you're not there, but that's not a good sign there in 2000. 55k that stinks yeah i'm i'm not there and i hadn't been watching so i don't know what's going on you know what i mean i'm home and i'm getting ready to open the gym oh that's where you were doing that's right yeah how big was the gym it was the biggest gym in the keys 70 almost eight thousand square feet but you couldn't have chain stores in the keys so there couldn't be a goals gym or a uh, all these gyms that pop up today. Yeah. Interesting. That's kind of like where um, my wife's parents live. They don't allow any chain at all. Everything is, is like mom and pops and stuff like that. Yeah. And uh, I was in uh, Massachusetts lately and Concord, there is no chain stores and their signs there's no lit signs. They have to be wooden, like, you know, Concord and Lexington were the seat of the Revolutionary War. So they have to look old. Yeah. I like but, that. Uh, old school. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I th but I think the keys have changed it too now. But when I, I, I don't think they're allowing fitness centers to be changed. But I did find out that, but they could be small. I don't know. Maybe they're in stores. Uh, Starbucks, but I mean, it, it was it was nice not to see the same stuff. You know what I mean? Like we used to get uh, uh, meat at a grocery store that had been there since 1945. It was a little mom and pop's place. It was nice. I survived a long time. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Did you make money off the gym? Oh yeah, I bought the land. Knocked the building down. I I had uh, with the land in the building was a million, and then I had to pay for the. I would have had like a, if I rented the at least the equipment. I think the percentage to lease on a one gym only, not a chain, was thirty three percent. So I went and bought the equipment. 
So I had about one three seven tied up. Yeah, we made money when we sold. Nice. Nice. Yeah. So as far as this, obviously only fifty five k. I mean that that's a bad sign. And months later, about four or five months later, Deb said we closed the doors, kind of leading in that direction where it's just headed downhill here. Um, this will be one of the last pay per views, one of the last shows for Russo as he's out in like the Bischoff regime, and Johnny Ace will be will be headed in pretty sure uh, shortly after this. It's almost kind of fifty five k. You know, not that many people attending. The ratings are going down. It's kind of writing on the wall a little bit here for Russo to be gone relatively soon thereafter. You know, you mentioned something, Johnny. Is Johnny back with W W F E? No, no. They said golden parachute. I don't think he'll be back. Okay. I did oddly talk to Terry Taylor today, though. Not to reveal anything or what we talked about, but uh, privately, something privately yeah. I was talking to. So he, Terry Taylor, is still there, but Johnny Ace is gone. Oh, good. I'm glad Terry's there. Good for him. Yeah, he's down there at the uh, Performance Center. He's, still, he's one of the finishing coaches for uh, HBK and Triple H. Oh, good. Good. But I don't know if Johnny Ace will... All the sexual con misconduct stuff and all the allegations, I don't know if they'll ever bring him back. I don't think so. But if it's if it's true that he got a golden parachute, probably doesn't need to financially ever return. I think he probably did get one, don't you? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Him, at this point, he's going to be on his way in, obviously, after Japan, and he's going to help WCW in, in their waning months. But here with the Russo-Ferrara, and actually, Ed, Ed Ferrara is there until the dying days, too. So when Russo leaves, Ed stays. So it's not like they're connected at the hip, per se. Russo kind of, you know, it has his own path here and maybe his own direction. I know we've talked about this a little bit. It almost seems like sometimes the show wasn't necessarily written for WWE to succeed, but maybe for other people to maybe see what he can offer as far as writing. Do you know, you know what I'm saying? Do you, you agree with that at all? Yeah, like there was a behind the scenes, let me write a show that's a com comic show on wrestling. And try maybe, to sell it. maybe sell to Fox, so maybe get it picked up. I know he did end up writing, I think, some sort of screenplay or some sort of treatment or something for Fox that had to do with wrestling. I, Rope Opera was was something, a part of that, too. I know it came out of the book, but I know that was a part of it. Maybe that was his end goal. It might have been. might have been. I mean, at this time, I was so far removed from it. You know what I mean? I have no idea at this time when I before I left I looked at it and I said wow this is very different you know I wasn't really intrigued to watch it you know what I mean I could definitely see that at this point I mean I still watch I still order the shows but I was like man this is not the same WCW when the NWO was kicking ass and you know, you guys were so much different and so much better. It's almost like, wow, WWF was just destroying WCW at this point in 2000. It was in insane, the numbers. Yeah, they got on the roll and they went back and they had the best heel, the best baby face in the business. They had Vince, who at the time was the greatest heel of all times. And then they had uh, Austin. Absolutely. You can't go wrong with those two. And even when Austin got hurt, they had The Rock basically filled right. in as a top baby face. So, yeah. I know you said before, it's a little unfair. It was almost like having Hogan and Savage in their prime, having Austin and Rock in their prime going up against you guys. It's almost that kind of star power going on. And if you look at it, errors change, things progress. No disrespect to Hogan or Randy, but at that time, I would have taken The Rock and uh, Austin. They were fresher, right? Yep. A lot of, not saying they were better. I'm just saying they hadn't been exposed as much. They hadn't been in somewhat uh, circumstantial finishes that weren't good. You know what I mean? They were kind of unscathed yet. Yep. And I know when I was in high school at that point, like my buddy wanted to be Austin, I want to be the rock or, you know, vice versa. Like those are the guys you want to be. I mean, still like Hogan and Savage, but they were almost right. like they're older, kind of past their, you want to be the guys that are in their prime. You want to be, you know, Steve Austin and kicking and, guys ass, stunner people. And you want to be the cool guys. And they were cool. Yep. Yeah. 
So as far as this show is concerned, it's going to be Chivani, Stevie Ray, and Mark Madden as the commentator. So we mentioned them before. It's kind of an interesting uh, team that they put together. They, you know, they'll have the video pump it up to show Booker T versus Scott Steiner's the main event. Weird way to start the show, though. So they have Booker T. You know, they're showing him coming in, signing autographs for the fans. Like, okay, oh, he's popular. He's the babyface. He's the world champion at this point. Then they show Scott Steiner. He wants nothing to do with anybody. Uh, Fit Finley gives him a pen, says, hey, you know, sign into the building or you know, whatever he says to him. Steiner takes out a baseball bat or, or lead pipe and just, just starts destroying stuff at, just out of nowhere. So it just I, I don't know if that was just to show the parallels of uh, Booker T's, the everyman. He's signing autographs to people. Steiner, you say the wrong thing to him. He snaps and he starts breaking equipment. I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, do you I, like that? Does it does it make you think like, wow, this guy's nuts or? You're not, it isn't driving people to buy the t- pay-per-view. You either bought it or not. I don't know. To me, it was like, okay, we, like we get it with, with Steiner, but it, I don't know. It just seemed oddly out of place. It was weird. It was like Booker T signing the autographs and all of a sudden they show Steiner destroying what, stuff. What, what I'm getting at, he destroys stuff. You either bought the pay-per-view at this time or you didn't. Right. Yep. So you weren't going to get any more buys. It wasn't like you did something cool on Nitro and your friend called you and said, hey, tune it on. They just did this and this and you turn it on. If you didn't buy the pay-per-view, you weren't going to turn it by the pay-per-view because Steiner right. did something with a bat. I think it was, you know, shock TV. Yep. Yeah. So they have a little video that says Mayhem, Violent or Extreme Disorder, Chaos, just kind of explaining this is Mayhem, Goldberg versus Luger tonight, Nash and DDP versus The Perfect Event, Booker T versus Scott Steiner. Then it says, you've seen, the, you've seen the family, you've had the turkey, now get ready to bash some heads live. And they go you know, they go to the show. So they're trying to you know, make a little cutesy thing here and, and pump up the show. And the first guy that comes out is the nature boy, Rick Flair, who's now announced. I don't know. I don't remember how it actually happened, but Flair had become the CEO of WCW. And that was the storyline. He comes out in a suit. Remember he had the short spiky hair for some reason. Yeah, He had like a different look to him, but he was now the CEO. He welcomes you to the show and he said, we're, you know, we're going to have a great show and uh, you know, everybody enjoy the matches, but it was just something to, to show that Flair is still there. And for some reason they have him quoted as being the CEO of the company. Okay. I wonder how he became the CEO. I don't recall, and, and it, it doesn't say here, but I, I don't remember. I just remember thinking, remember he was the commissioner? Like, okay, they, it kind of yeah. made sense then, but I don't remember how the CEO part comes in because that's almost, I don't know, that would almost be what, like Ted Turner or, you know what I mean? <laughs> it would be somebody of, yeah. of, of that ilk. Somebody with a lot of money would be the CEO of the company. Right, right. It would be somebody running the company. I feel like it's the same exact thing as the commissioner, but they don't want to say that it's the commissioner because that's old hat, but it's the same exact role as being the commissioner of the company. Okay. feels like that in, in wrestling in general kind of became passe. I mean, remember everybody had a commissioner. Yeah. Foley was the commissioner. And Shawn Michaels is the commissioner. And like it's just all Austin was the commissioner for a minute. Like it just it overdone. They did the general manager. It's just so overdone in wrestling. Yeah, I agree with you. So we start off the first match, the WCW Cruiserweight Championship. Mike Sanders, above average Mike Sanders, who's the champion, defends against Kiwi and defeats him. He, of course, was with Paisley. The match goes about eight minutes. Mike Sanders, pretty good match here. Nothing crazy, nothing right home about here. But above Mike's, uh, above average, Mike Sanders gets the win over Kiwi. Mike was a good performer. Worked hard. Yeah, no, you were saying that you liked Mike. So you, yeah. you were very familiar with him. Yes, I was. What do you think about him as a talker? I was never. Uh, that's something you have to grow into, I believe, as a young guy. I mean, you're against some of the greatest talkers of all times in that dress room. So, I mean, the uh, the uh, MJFs of few and far between. Right, to come in the business and take it over. Yeah, I think he could have grown into it. Mike, I to me, for for as young as he was in the business there, and as inex- inexperienced as he was, great talker for you know for being that young into the business at that point. I really liked him. Yeah, I did too. I thought he had a lot of uh, potential. Now, Kiwi, 
you know, he's kind of doing the Adrian Street gimmick here. I, it didn't really fit him. If and especially if you know Alan Funk, he, you know, he's kind of a, 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 a not muscly, but you know, he's he's decent, oh, stocky he's, guys. He's ripped now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's ripped. Yeah. He's, even back then, he was pretty ripped. But yeah. if you know him, he's not like a, uh, I don't know, soft guy, if you will. He he's a, he's a, he's a guy, tough guy. You know, tough guy. I don't want to mess with him. Right. Right. And they have him doing an Adrian Street s gimmick. No, if, you could tell it's like if the guy's not really into the gimmick, he'll do it. But if he's not really into it, you know what I mean? You're you're not buying it as a fan. Right. Adrian was terrific. It's hard to follow a guy that was that good. And if you're not into it, it's very difficult. I don't know if you've ever heard the story of DDP and Mike Sanders. DDP apparently said SOL backstage, you know, shit out of luck. And he was saying like that maybe he'll use it as a catchphrase. Mike Sanders takes it and he says it on TV and DDP is like, well, now I can never use it. You said on TV, it's yours now. Like, have that ever happened? Like in the business you've heard of like guys taking other guys, catchphrases, <laughs> just saying it on TV so that the other guy won't be able to use it. I never heard that one before. No. Apparently there was a little bit of heat there with DDP and Mike Sanders and my, and I've interviewed Mike for, and he said that is true that he heard him say, and he was like, well, I think that works for us. That works for the thrillers. I think if we'll, we said it, I think it would be funny. And I think Nash said, yeah, you do it. Like it'd be funny. And DDP apparently was pissed because he was eventually going to use that as a catchphrase. Okay. I mean, uh, if Mike said it was true, I mean, but how many catchphrases can you have? TDP had a lot. Yeah, yeah. Maybe uh, he, maybe he's got to give some out instead of trying to hog them all. Give give out some catchphrases. Page was a, over. He was over. Can't take it away from him. Oh, big time. And yeah. we'll we'll talk about him in a little bit because him and Kevin Nash are in a team called the Insiders. We'll get to that uh, in a second. Alex Wright is backstage with Disco Inferno, and they're talking to Chronic. They're talking about Billy Kidman and Rey Mysterio, maybe helping them later on in the night. A little teasing, a little foreshadowing of maybe some interference going on. So then we go to a three-way tag team match, three count. Shane Helms and Shannon Moore defeated Evan Courageous and Jamie Noble and the young dragons of Yoon Yang, who's Jimmy Yang and Kaz Hayashi with Leia Meow. And this triple threat match goes about 11 minutes. Pretty damn good here. Those are It's a three-way tag. It's, a, it's one of those car crashes. It's one of those cruiserweight matches. They're all over the place. But these six guys, I remember during this period of time, they were doing some stuff you've never seen anywhere else, and they just didn't stop. I mean, they were all great. I'm sure they were. I'm sure it was very, very good. It was brand new to the viewers. They added a different style. I remember Shane Helms was saying he was the innovator of offense because he was doing all these crazy moves. And it was really, you know, it's like a car crash per se, but it was it flippity floppy stuff, as Braun Strowman calls it. But it was so much different than what was on the rest of the card. It stood out. And, and it, you know, you got to have, right? You got to have a buffet out there. That's what I say. There's room for everything. As long as it's good, as long as it puts people in seats. More of it, the better it is. And I feel like these guys were trying so hard, too. Like, they wanted to have the best match on the show. There weren't, you know, some of the old veterans that they would say that WCW would have that, oh, they just showed up, collect the paycheck, they don't work house shows. These six guys were, like, you know, literally breaking each other's necks and stuff. Not not so literally, but, you know, they were they were going crazy doing all this stuff to try to really work, hard, work out work everybody else in the car, work harder than everybody else. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. I know most of them very well in the hard working guys. So here is something that's interesting. We were talking about Crash TV. So they do a segment in the back. Bam Bam Bigelow is talking to that 70s guy, Mike Awesome. A Wall, A Wall, Sergeant A Wall kind of gets involved. Then they cut to Pamela Paul Shock interviewing Disco and um, Alex Wright, then Chronic, and, and then we cut to Jimmy Hart talking about his match with Man Cow with Mean Gene. Is that like could the crash TV? Is that not necessary for pay per view to go from literally wrestling match, interview, interview, interview? Like to me, it's it's too much. Am I, am I right or am I wrong? I think it's like you're making the cake and it's supposed to be a chocolate cake, and you start throwing raisins and cherries and sour cream and everything else. It's too much. What do you think about that style, the crash TV style? 
I don't like it. I don't like it. It's it's just there's no story. It's just shock, 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 shock. Uh, eventually, you burn the people out. You only get so many times people are going to sit and watch something like that. You got to catch them, and it got to be psychology. You know. Uh, you know. Usually, I can tell if I'm going to like a movie inside of six minutes. You know, they've laid the story out. You know, I know what's going on in six minutes. If it's all over the place, like I saw, uh, you know who David Lynch is? Oh, yes. Have you ever seen A Race Ahead? No. Mm -mm. It was one of his first. Whoa. 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 And he's supposed to be a genius. You know, he did Blue Velvet. Have you ever seen that one? No, but I've seen Twin Peaks. Have you seen Twin Peaks? Yeah. The TV show, yeah. Yeah, and then I get we got a return to Twin Peaks now, you know. Yep. Well, Which was well, weird. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you think that was weird, watch a race ahead. It's the strangest thing I've ever seen. It, it, but now it's a cult classic. It plays in the movies like the Rocky Horror Picture Show at midnight. But boy, I thought, what is going on here? It just. I can see why, and he's supposed to be a big time director, right? And writing, yeah. wrote and directed it. Yep. I thought, I can see why this was a flop. Maybe he, he worked. I, I, I did watch Blue uh, Velvet. He's got some big stars in there, but that's another one. It's all over the place. So, I mean, maybe there's an audience for it, but I don't think in sports there's an audience. Let's go to baseball real quick, okay, where I'm mm -hmm. talking about this. Ah, they're doing away with the shifts, right? Yeah. Okay. So now what are they going to do? You know, the shifts, you know how the shift started? Probably because of, like, Ortiz and guys. Like, actually, yeah. Ted Williams, no? Didn't they, yeah. didn't they used to do it? Ted Williams? The yeah. The yep. guy's name was Lou Boudreau. He was the play manager for the Cleveland Indians. This is in, I believe, like late 40s. It was by 50 he was in, okay? So what are we going to do now? Go back and give Williams 40 more points as batting average? Right, yeah. So uh, Noma, when he hit, what, 376? So does he, you know, and they work the shift on him. So is he a 400 hitter now? You know, when things aren't broken, why do you try to fix it? Do you know what I'm saying? This yep. is about you know, what you brought up about all this throwing so much shit at people. You can't absorb that much shit. I agree. It felt like no, nothing could breathe. Like three count one, a pretty good match, and and it's forgotten about because there's five segments in within two minutes after that. Right, right. So then you'll love this one: Jimmy Hart versus Man Cow. Yeah, I don't know if you, uh, you're probably familiar with Man Cow. He's the yes. sh shock jock kind of Howard Stern wannabe guy. Yeah, I've been on a show a couple times. Oh, you have? Been? Oh, I didn't know that. What was that like? It's a very nice guy. He's in Tampa now. I was a dabba. So he must be just a huge wrestling fan. Yeah, he was a good guy. So are you the one that made the initial? Because no. I know he's obviously been there before to get him in. No, no, no. Jimmy probably did that. I don't know if it helped, like, get anybody interested in the show that had man cows on it. It might not have helped the show, but it, it uh, alerted people that there was you could buy the pay-per-view. Free advertising? Yeah. So Man Cow defeated with all of his entourage. Man Cow defeated Jimmy Hart in one minute and thirty seconds. Oof. Just I don't know. To me, weird that that's on a pay per view. I know that's been on some pre shows. I know Danny Bonaduce like they've been on pre shows, but not the actual pay per view itself. Like we don't at home, we don't need to see that. No, I don't think so either. And Jimmy would be the first one to tell you that. I think Jimmy's the hottest working man in show business. Next, you know, he works yep. hard. He's still working on it. 
So then we have three segments after that, just rapid fire. Mike Awesome does something. Lance Storm does something. The Misfits in Action do something. Um, then Pamela Paulshock is with uh, Conan and Billy Kidman. And uh, no, I'm sorry, not Conan, uh, Ray Mysterio, Billy Kidman, and Tigress. Uh, so it was like four things bing, bang, boom, rapid fire of, of what's going on in the back. So even more Crash TV for the pay per view. Okay, you've lost me already, right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's too much. Yeah. So then we have Crowbar up next, your buddy Crowbar, defeating Big Vito and Reno in a hardcore match. Um, to retain his WW Hardcore Championship match goes about eight minutes. It was okay. It was just kind of all over the place, um, almost like a car crash. But the winner and still champion, your buddy Crowbar. Yeah, Chris is a hard worker. Yeah. So then we go backstage. Buff does something. Nash is doing something. DDP is doing something. Then uh, Mean Gene interviews Miss Jones and Ernest the Cat Miller. So again. Well, I'll say more crash TV stuff on a pay per view. To me, I don't know that maybe for a TV show or whatever that might work, but pay per view, it doesn't fly for me. You're paid to see action. That's why you bought the pay per view, right? Yep. So this to me is sort of like a bait and switch. Absolutely. It very much felt like just another nitro kind of kind of going on, not not a pay per view. Doesn't even sound like a good nitro either. <laughs> no, no, not so far. Anyway, so next up, the filthy animals, Billy Kidman and Ray Mysterio with Tigris defeated Chronic, Brian Adams, Brian Clark, and Alex Wright with Disco Inferno in a handicap match. The match goes about eight minutes, and it was okay. It was a little bit of a cluster, and it's I know Chronic ends up kind of not getting along with Alex Wright and Disco, and that's kind of why they lose. But to me, too much going on. There was just too much silliness. And Chronic were very good. They, they were very misused. So then we go to the back, and the filthy or Natural Born Thrillers have a segment. Then Mean Gene is interviewing Scott Steiner and Medasia, which was uh, interesting. I always just liked... This, just the Steiner character in general, because you could tell he wasn't fake. You know what I mean? He was being himself. He's just nuts. Yeah, yeah. Did you like his promos? I thought sometimes they were scary, and sometimes they were hilarious. The, the addition and subtraction multiplication one. <laughs> you remember that yep. one? Yep, 33%. Yeah, yeah. And then some of them were scary. It's good. I, I mean, I think Scott is. I think Scott was never used the way he should have been. I feel like they were trying to go in that direction here. Him being like dominant and crazy and allowed to be himself, but I don't. It, it just it never. I don't know. It never got rolling for for whatever reason. Maybe just because WWF was on such a roll, but it never kind of got rolling as where it should have been. Well, he went to WWF and he really never got over like he should have. You know what yeah. I mean? I think the people in the offices were afraid of Scott. Definitely. Yeah. And even Triple H and Shawn Michaels and Flair, he apparently, as everyone says, he even says it in one of his shooting interviews, he would tell them what's on his mind. He did not kowtow to them at all. They told him to take a drug test. He said, Triple H, you're coming with me if I'm if, if I'm taking a test. And, oh I, oh, I don't need to take a test. Well, then I don't either. And then they both never took one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Scott's an outspoken guy. Uh I've learned to, after all these years that I've known Scott, I've learned to appreciate Scott as a person a lot more. And I keep on going back about posters, right? Put him on a poster against anybody, and it works. Uh, Nobody looked like Scott Steiner. I don't think in the history of the wrestling business, except maybe Billy Graham. Yeah. Yep. The, the genetic freak. Yeah, I don't know what it was that 
I guess they were afraid that he wouldn't show up or he would drop the belt or whatever. But man, you got to take a chance sometimes. <laughs> you know what I mean? I have, you know, we always relate to baseball. We got we got Nolan Ryan on, on the mound, right? He's the leader of strikeouts of all times by far, right? Yep. He's also the leader of walks and hit batsmen. <laughs> you know what I mean? So you got to take a chance if you... The, you know, I think Scott would have been a. I think Scott would have been a great three-year world heavyweight champion. I I loved him. I wanted him to be the champ for a long time before that. Yeah. Remember when Hogan towards like the end of the NWO? I almost wish Steiner would have beat Hogan and kind of got that big push, or beat beat Goldberg and ended the Goldberg streak and got a huge push out of it. That would have drawn a lot of money. You know what I'm saying? For sure. Yeah. Yeah. So next up, we have Ernest the Cat Miller with Miss Jones defeating Shane Douglas with Tori Wilson in about eight minutes. Nothing really to, to kind of say about this one. It was, I don't know, it was kind of just blah. I was kind of expecting better from Ernest Miller and Shane here, but I don't know. Maybe the chemistry wasn't there, but just nothing really good to, to, to talk about there. Nothing to write home about, if you will. Yeah, I don't know, you know, what was going on there, so I can't really judge. But sometimes when the show is starts off wrong, it gets a bad vibe. Yeah. Yeah. So then we have Bam Bam Bigelow defeating Sergeant Awall in about six minutes. Again, nothing great here. Nothing. It almost feels like too many matches. It's going to be 12 in total on the show. It's almost uh. too many matches on the card. But I don't know. This just wasn't there either. Bammer wins with the greetings for Asbury Park, and that's kind of it. Nothing, nothing great, nothing bad. Just eh. I mean, uh, I like cheesesteaks, but after one and a half, I'm done. I couldn't eat 12. You know what I mean? Yep. Too much. So then up next is the Canadian Heavyweight Championship, not the U.S. Heavyweight Championship. Lance Storm is the champion. It would be General Hugh G. Rection defeating Lance Storm with major guns in about 6 minutes, 30 seconds to win the WCW United States Championship and rechristen it the U.S. title and no longer the Canadian title. I know you were saying you kind of like the Canadian title. It's kind of an interesting thing for Lance Storm. Yeah, up in Canada. <laughs> you know what I mean? I like that in Canada. Yep. Especially, you know, they. I think they were trying to get up in more of those major markets up there. Yeah, they were running there, not a lot, but they were trying to run there more often for sure. Yeah. And yeah. Lance was one of obviously one of the, the top guys. I know you do not like the general huge erection name. You're not a big fan of that. No, I'm not. I mean, maybe I'm passe, but coming down the aisle right now, ladies and gentlemen, the world heavyweight champion, the continental champion, the New York heavyweight champion, or oh, whatever, a huge erection. Come on. <laughs> Why don't you just say, coming down the aisle, another fake wrestler? Terrible name. Weird, weird gimmick, terrible name. Didn't, uh, never, uh, uh, never liked that one. So next up, we have Jeff Jarrett defeating Buff Bagwell in 11 minutes. This was actually a pretty good match here. But it's funny. It's like a lot of these singles matches with really no stakes, nothing going on. It's just kind of, I don't know, and it's not really progressing storylines as much here. But Jeff ends up beating uh, Buff Bagwell here. I thought it was a pretty good match. But it, I don't know, it doesn't do anything. Uh, maybe it puts Jarrett up to the next level. But there's no progression for Buff here. And it doesn't really put Jarrett in, in a higher higher light on the card. So what you're telling me, because I didn't see the match, it didn't do anything for anybody. That's what it felt like. Jarrett wins, and like he stays exactly where he was, and like where does he go from here? It's very weird. It's a pay-per-view, too. Okay. So next up, the Insiders, DDP and Kevin Nash, defeated the perfect event, Chuck Palumbo and Sean Stasiak for the WWE. Tag team championship. Pretty good match. Match goes to about 15 minutes. So long match here. But interesting to know DDP, because remember uh, Scott Hall was fired at this point and will not be brought back. So they put DDP and Nash together instead of the outsiders, they're the insiders. You'll, do you like that? No. 
Do you like DDP and Nash as a team? Yeah, but I don't just weaken them. When you say insiders, what do you think are right off the bat? Outsiders, right? Yeah. I don't give a shit how good the page is. He's not going to be as good as Scott Hall. And who, when you think about the original NWO, who is it? Hall, Nash, and Hogan. Yeah, but the original two was Hall and Nash. Oh, yes, yes. So you're watering down your guys already. Come up with a more creative name than the insiders. It sounds like the honeymooners, for Christ's sakes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but here they're, they're working with the young guys. Do you like that, though, like Nash and DDP? I know they, they, they win, they go over, but, and they're eventually – uh, we'll lose back, back the titles then, but do you like that they're working with the young guys, uh, Stasiak and Palumbo here, trying to you know help them along? This seems to me as a ploy from someone that's writing the show to get a bunch of young guys on his side. What do you mean? Uh, okay. Stars are stars. Were these Columbo, uh, Palumbo and Sazak, who are very good, were they given a push to get there? No. Nah, kind of just thrown right in. No, and hopefully, they, yeah. no there was no push. Don't, don't shoot the door. There was no <laughs> fucking push. Right. You take your two guys who everybody knows is going to win, and you waste time. If Let's do something different. The baby faces are uh, Nash and uh, Paige, right? What if somewhere during the match there's something wild going on, breaking the four way, and boom, Paige goes to spare somebody, or somebody, and the guy steps away and they spare Kevin. Paige goes to the floor, and the young guys do something off the top. Or uh, Kevin goes to the floor, and Paige is in there, and the young guys do something off the top. Boom, one, two, three, and Kevin's scrambling in. You get people say, holy shit, what's going on? You trying to tell me that the 55,000 people that bought that pay-per-view, I'm going to tell you 54,999 people that bought that pay-per-view knew National Hall, uh, National uh, Page. Uh, Page were going over. Why have the match? You're charging money. To me, too, almost a cheating way to, to give the guys a quote-unquote push. Like, immediately put them against two big guys. I know they wrestled before that, but it didn't seem like they were in line to be wrestling those two guys. You know what I mean? Like, the, that, those are two huge names. There was no push. That hurt them. They became fodder. To push a guy, you got... I know how to get a guy over in six weeks. It's simple. How do you do it? He doesn't oversell. He doesn't get covered. And when he covers a guy, it's the finish. You don't put him in there with two of your biggest stars and saying, oh, we're giving the young guys a break. They'd be in doing jobs. What the fuck? Does that make any sense to you if these young... But it seems to me you're recruiting guys and saying, oh, I'm giving you a break here. We're going to give you a big push. You're working with Paige and Nash, the two biggest stars we got. <laughs> you're still doing jobs. J-O-B's, as Scott used to say. I don't know. I'm probably completely wrong. To me, it was almost like too much too soon. Like they were, They shouldn't have been in that spot. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to say another thing to you. Mm -hmm. The most important thing. Did that sell one pay-per-view? No. Why do it? Isn't the whole thing to driven to get money? For buys? Did that help you? When you have a piece of paper in your book and you're going to say to yourself, okay, pro and con, which is going to draw me money? Which am I doing for my own gratification and sucking up to somebody? It's it's business. Now, if those kids won, I'd say, yeah. And they could come up with a creative finish that wouldn't hurt Paige and Kevin 
and people have been talking about it till the next Nitro say, oh, I got to watch Nitro. They're going to do something else. Those kids won. You think people are saying, I can't wait to watch Nitro Monday because Colombo and Stasek may have a return match for what? So are they getting a push, JP? Uh, it might be doing more harm than good, like you said. Yeah, of course. Yep. Yeah. So then after uh, Nash and DDP win, we go to the next match, Goldberg versus... Lex Luger. Goldberg defeats Luger in about six minutes. The storyline here was that if Goldberg lost, he would be forced to retire. So that was the kind of the ongoing storyline with Goldberg Why? there. But Russo Why? thing. Russo thing that he did. Well, if Goldberg. The reason. Why? What's the reason he has to retire? The whole thing was predicated on Russo saying you have to beat your old streak. You have to be 174 and 0 instead of 173 and 0, or you have to retire. That Wait a minute. Has he won 170 matches now? Again? No, he's very early on in, his, in in the new streak here. So. So they're going old hat and doing the streak all over again, which probably is not the best idea either to copy an old good storyline. Unless you love it, I don't know. Is it doing God with the Wind again with uh, James Gardner playing Errol? Uh, Clock Gables role. <laughs> right. And uh, <laughs> Pamela Anderson doing Maureen O'Hara's role. But it's Goldberg again doing his own his own thing again, the streak. Kind of it didn't work. It very odd. It just didn't seem right. Yeah, and and a guy that was a great draw, Luga goes six minutes. Yep. Probably because you get twelve matches on the show. They probably couldn't give it enough time, which kind of stinks. Yeah, okay. And that, that tag match went 15 minutes. That could have been way shorter. You could have had six or seven matches and given everybody time. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So next up, the last match, the main event of the evening, Scott Steiner with Medasia defeated Booker T by technical submission. He knocked him out in about 13 minutes to win the WCW World Heavyweight Championship. This was a straight jacket caged heat match, which means the cage is up, but it, there's an enclosure, so they called it caged heat. That was their version, I guess, of a hell in the cell, so to speak, without saying hell in the cell. And there was a straight jacket involved as well because Steiner is a madman. So they put that little stipulation in there as well. It's actually a pretty good match, to be honest, for the most part with these two, as Steiner pe makes uh, Booker T pass out in the Steiner recliner to win the WCW title in 13 minutes. <laughs> You know, there could have been a lawsuit too close. Cage, teat, hell in the cell. Well, it's their version of hell in the cell. It's just yeah, called but, cage, cage. No, no, teat. no. What I'm saying is, isn't, I mean, a lot of people could uh, try to push that through on a lawsuit. Cage, oh, of, co of course. Yeah. Yep. Wow. That's creative. Do you like the straight jacket being involved Absolutely as well? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. He's a nuts. You want him to be a nuts. He's an ass kicker. Why why saddle people with all this bullshit? He's the heel, right? And and he ends up beating Booker T. Just he knocks him out. He wins. But to me, he had the Austin vibe. I was rooting for him to win. I wanted him to be the champ. The crowd kind of was too, even though Booker T's a good baby face, they kind of wanted him to win too. Here's the thing. Booker is a very good babyface, one of the best. But Steiner at that time started to get Austin-esque. He was saying what the hell he wanted to say. It. He was bringing tigers to the ring. He had a beautiful woman on his side, um, right? Oh, Medeja, yes. Oh, yeah. Who didn't want to cheer for him? He'd be an idiot not to cheer for him. Yeah. Yep. So, I mean, and they had to see this, that people were cheering. Well, Dusty Rhodes used to have a great uh, line. Dusty and I would talk about stuff when people started, like they started to cheer for Rick Steiner. You know? Yeah. I, I said to Dusty, we can't keep him he he heel much longer. He said, yeah, brother, it's like 
fish going upstream. We're going against the, the river. You know what I mean? Yep. He could have been a huge baby face. I agree. You don't and think that, kids would have bought his dolls? And Oh, man. I just remember because very few people watched WCW, but anybody that did watch WCW at that point, they loved uh, Scott Steiner and, and Goldberg. Those were the two guys that they loved, but they loved Scott Steiner. He was just, he was over huge. He was that cool heel. Everybody kind of wanted to to be him. They were acting like him. He he just, he could do no wrong. Plus he had Medasia. I mean, he was just a, a cool, cool, um, cool villain, if you will. A very, very cool guy. So how would you rate the show? Would you give it two thumbs up, two thumbs down? How are you rating it? I give it two thumbs up, two toes up, and I take my head head off. I give it nothing. What would you give it? Uh, thumbs down, I guess. Uh, I mean, I like I Steiner winning it. I like the main event, but probably thumbs down. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I just like Steiner. I like him winning the title finally. But oh, I do too. Yeah. But I, I mean, did we have to suffer through that? Yeah, just to get to that. Yeah, twelve matches is too long too. It just a long show. And nothing made sense except for Steiner, who who came out of there looking good. Yeah, because even after the match, he beats up Booker T and the ref after the match. He looks even better. So he was the only one really that got over on the show. Yeah. So oh, let's hit the wow. let's hit the plugs. You follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Two Man Power Trip. Check the website tmptempire.com. Follow Kevin on Instagram at Taskmaster Talks. Go to Prosing Tees, Prosing Tees.com, and visit the Kevin Sullivan store. Kevin, what else you got going on? I'm on uh, Saturday. I'm actually in Miami at uh, for CCW, so I'm looking forward to that. Matter signing. So any of my friends of the show come by and tell me what a great job. J JP and I are doing. Yes, that would be great. Thank okay. you uh, to Kevin and thank you everybody out there for listening. We'll see you right back here next week for a little Taskmaster Talks with Kevin Sullivan. We'll see you next week, folks.